clinics today and uh, I didn't even much think about what we are going to have this evening but then suddenly after 5.30 I you know, thought of speaking on and say the nature of knowledge I think that might be a good subject to say something about so, and because that is a subject on which perhaps people I made out a little case about last time that uh, there is a connection between the individual making an effort for his own evolution and the forces that work in human nature are the forces that he has inherited in the growth of evolutionary movement of universal nature. Universal energy has evolved and man is at a stage where he inherits all that is in the nature, the upward tendency and the inconscience which hold him back uh, to fundamental ignorance, so to say, unconsciousness and inertness and so on. That is what uh, we had uh, seen last time and also the necessity of overcoming it and the conditions of overcoming it. But uh, still there are attempts or there are efforts in the human being, particularly recent efforts in which we are told that this is uh, an unnecessary movement, almost a self-infliction on the part of man to try to do something himself. In fact, science has now so far advanced that it becomes redundant to try to change man's nature by an inner process. All change, be, change can be brought about by an outer process. There is legislation, there is, you know, the, the, the social machinery at work, there is a five-year plan is possible, 15 years plan is possible, then international movement is possible, then a sort of a constitution of mankind can be brought into existence, and human nature can be changed. Why do you want to resort to an inner process in order to bring about outer knowledge, outer change? Now, this involves a very deep philosophical question of what is knowledge? Nature of knowledge. Say, what do you see when you say this man has got knowledge? What do we mean to imply when we say he has got knowledge? In nine cases out of ten, we say he has got information. He has read the books on the subject in which he is interested. He has studied the subject. He has given time to it, effort concentration, what past, what has been done on the subject in the past, he has tried to acquaint himself with. And if he has accepted all that, then you say, he possesses all that knowledge now within himself. If he agrees with that knowledge, he substantiates, he supports it by his own logic. If he does not agree, he gives his own reason for differing. And so we say, he has got the knowledge. But in fact, what knowledge he has got is something that amounts to or becomes a nature of information only, more or less, an information about a subject in which he is interested. He has got an information and he is informed about it, he can expound it, he can understand it or uh, so on. Knowledge in Indian outlook has been regarded in two ways, that is there are two kinds of knowledge. One is called avidya and another is called vidya. Avidya means, really speaking, ignorance. But in ignorance is included all the knowledge of the objective world. When in Indian philosophy or yogic parlance they speak about vidya and avidya, by avidya is meant ignorance. But ignorance means objective knowledge, knowledge of things outside oneself. That is called ignorance. This is a definition which people uh, in this part of the world should try to understand because when an Indian speaks of ignorance, he does not speak of, uh, uh, you know, not knowing the thing. He speaks of uh, knowledge only of the outside world is called ignorance. Knowledge of oneself or inner world is called knowledge. That is called vidya, true knowledge. So that uh, there is a distinction with which we start. And this has been now challenged by a very powerful school of uh, intellectuals uh, you know, in the world today, the scientists. The scientists have laid a claim that all this is redundant effort. Because, first of all, the philosophers never agree among themselves. 
and uh, different systems. One man comes and propounds something. After 100 or 50 years, another comes and propounds something else with equal rationality and support of his arguments which carry conviction to any ordinary man who will follow his steps and his axioms which he take for granted. If you grant the, the, the basis, then the conclusion of the philosopher becomes uh, almost inevitable. You have to accept. If you take Hegel, then Hegel starts with something, and if he leads you to the conclusion, you say he's right. If you take Kant, then Kant will lead you to his conclusion. So that uh, reason for reason, there is no no point in saying that a certain philosophy is more true or has a greater content of knowledge, which which is true. So the scientists say all that is bosh. You will take throw it out because it's meaningless. This is all uh, you know wordy fight without any 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 solid uh, you know solid truth or concreteness behind it. You take to something concrete. We deal with something concrete. As I told you last time, they were speaking more boldly and a little more, uh, you know, with a self-confidence and self-complacence almost. But now they have lost a part of it. But still, their basis is that we deal with something which you can touch, which you can handle, which you can weigh, which you can use. But these people talk about infinity, absolute, divine cause, and, you know, a soul, uh, transformation, change. Uh, well, what is all this? This is words. But we deal with, oh yes, what do you deal with? We deal with facts. Yes. Facts of which life? Outer life. Facts of matter. We try to observe, to, to experiment, to try to understand, to patiently to carry out the experiment and understand the process at work and by mastering the knowledge of the process we give the application in life and you see how life has become rich now and improved and better in fact one friend was asking arguing today at our lunch that you see after all economics is something wonderful because it has created so much change in life this is quite true don't you think that edison or you know ford are great people in one sense, they are great because they have brought about a certain change in social structure of man. Their invention has applied to life, created a change in the social conditions of life, and partly inner condition also, psychological change also has been brought into mankind to some extent. And in that case, he can say that Socrates is not greater than, after all, you know, the, the Ford. After Ford has brought about a great change in mankind. What did Socrates do? If you judge by only external, probably this is not a wrong proposition. You can say he is right, perhaps he is right. But Socrates' ideas remain in somewhere in the book. Whereas here, at least you have read about a change in life. Now, this deception of the appearance and some reality of the appearance also is, well, you can say there is something behind it which has to be accepted, which is acceptable. But the claim of science that therefore because what we know is applicable to life today, therefore our knowledge is more valid, is not right. Knowledge may not be valid and yet it may be utilized. It is quite possible. It happens hundred times in human life that you do not know, the, your knowledge is not valid and yet the application of whatever you know might be useful. This happens hundreds of times in life. You see, it is not that how, how, how is a scientist, what does he know about matter for the matter of that? I told you last time that he doesn't know what is matter. He knows how to deal with matter. How to, how to utilize the process. Some, if a stream is flowing here. Now if you know that, oh, it is flowing from a higher level to a lower level, there I can put a wheel and if the wheel turns, I can raise up the water or create electricity. Now this... Knowledge of the process is valid, but from where the stream is coming, what is a stream? He doesn't know. See, the stream, you say a stream is flowing, level is high, level is low. I put a wheel here, it will turn. Then I will be able to ground a floor or do electric current or do something with the, with the, with the power that will be generated, right? So he has known the utility of a process and the knowledge of the process at the most. About the stream, its origin, and its nature as to what is the stream, he doesn't know. Something is flowing, you can call it X. Why a stream? 
and I am able to know how to utilize his acts. And the illusion is created because he is turning an actual wheel. So you say, oh Prabhu, he is turning the wheel, so he knows what is history. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. His utility and application to life gives us the wrong illusion that, oh, he must be a master of things. He is not. Because he doesn't know what he is dealing with. What is the content of his knowledge, the scientist's content of knowledge? About matter, about energy. Experiment, yes, but that is not knowledge. Experiment, I will go on doing it. You say, my process is going on. That's all that he can say at the most. He says, I will go on trying, 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 trying and making new hypotheses every day. Every day new hypothesis will come to explain what I know, what I experiment with and so on. I will be gone progressing. But what he gives as a conclusion of science is only a mental construction. Is only an intellectual representation. It's only a symbolic image. A circle... A, you know, track or, you know, the parabola or hyperbola. But these are all Im symbolic images. These are not knowledge in the sense of, you know, solid content of something which you can handle. It is an equation which is here somewhere. When a scientist says that you see a molecule or an atom moves in, uh, you see a, a parabolic circle or gives you a tensorial equation or tensorial calculus, what is he dealing with? He is only represent image, image, image representation is given to us. It is just as I told you that day that, you see, if, if you get a map of New York or London, it is, it is a representation. It is a mental construction. If he goes on describing, you first get down, the turn to the right, east, west, north, south, and all description is given. It is an intellectual representation of New York and not New York itself. It is not New York which he says. He is describing a mental picture which he is putting there. If he draws a map even, it is a representation, it is a scale, it is a symbol, it is not thing itself. The same thing with the scientist. He, he represents something, he gives a symbolic image, but he doesn't give you solidly this is the truth. How can he give? It's not possible for mind to do this work. But because of its application, an illusion is created that this is very solid knowledge and so on. And it is effective, it is good, it is necessary. We do not run down because we only want to say that the claim that this knowledge is valid and other knowledge is not valid is not tenable. It is not possible to substantiate the claim of the scientist that what he knows is more true than what a philosopher can know by his mind. That is one. Secondly, his complaint against philosophers is they differ from each other. Nobody agrees. And secondly, they use language and words to indicate ideas, to, to, to mean ideas, to represent ideas. And they are very vague. One man uses one term in one sense and the reader understands it in another sense and a third man uses it in the third sense and there is such a confusion, worst confounded, that you can never come to anything. Knowledge, language is a social product. And language is, a philosopher doesn't create his language. Scientist says, I create my language in the sense of I create mathematical you know, symbols and I deal in mathematics. So I create my own language in which there is no confusion because there is precision. Whereas here in philosophy, a philosopher is bound to use the language current in his time. It's a social product and all the implication of society, connotation of social, you know, words gets into his philosophy. And the content of one century is not the same as content of the other centuries, five centuries or six centuries afterwards. The same word perhaps is not the same social content of language. It becomes, become, becomes confusion. Therefore, the, the philosophers claim that he can give you some uh, no, valid knowledge is not correct. He gives you at most conceptual knowledge. He will call it conceptual knowledge, concepts. But even scientific knowledge, when you reduce it to its last term, is conceptual. It is not actual in the sense of something which everybody can handle. No. It is something which, about which he can give you also a concept, a mental picture and a structure. Is there no content behind metaphysics? 
and is science the only way of acquiring valid knowledge there are these are the questions which we can discuss with advantage what is the nature of knowledge when you say knowledge what do you mean to say this is knowledge when we begin to acquire knowledge of the subject the most uh, common process which we apply is use of our sense i e r nose capacity to weigh to touch to to taste and based on this sensation we try to perceive and our range of perception our range of sensation is limited so whatever knowledge even of the outer world we get is limited well this range is increased by science by instruments by microscope and telescope and you know the, the light experiment you find all kinds of instrument by which you find out the the increase range of application of sense sensation range is increased and therefore perception becomes more precise therefore conclusion becomes more correct intellectually the knowledge with the yogic sense wants to convey is the knowledge in which one puts into interrogation the question or one puts into interrogation the 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 whole knowledge which the sense apparatus gives and says is my apparatus of acquiring knowledge efficient i learn by my mind i learn by use of my senses yes now is this apparatus of mine quite efficient that leads you both to philosophy and to yogic life because you you want to say that have i got specs you say i see everything quite right and uh, what i see is right or true or real i say yes right but if a question comes have i got some specs on my eyes and if the specs are colored then all that i see will be colored isn't it so the metaphysician or the true philosopher always says yes i have an instrument of knowledge is it is it an efficient instrument and uh, can i depend upon the knowledge which it gives the idealistic philosopher stand is in one sense very strong he says that why how do do we depend upon the the evidence that is given to you by your sense and your mind how do you know that this instrument i which you have employed is is reliable so he puts into question the the whole apparatus and says well let me know Mm, uh, the the criterion of true knowledge. What is the sign of true knowledge? What are the characteristics of? I see a there the sky and the earth have met. Now this is evidence of the sense. Even a scientist doesn't admit this as correct evidence. The same the philosopher and the yogi takes up and says yes, my mind says that this world is what I see, but then. how do you know that what my sight shows is the limit of my potential or capable knowledge whatever knowledge i can acquire is not exhausted by the capacity of my sight and how to know that because i see this world therefore there is no other how how does it follow just as a scientist does not does not admit the apparent evidence of the sense but probes into it this yogi and the philosopher probe into the very knowledge with these instruments given say but how do you know and they want to find out why how how, how how are we compelled to depend upon these instruments and how to take away say for instance a, a certain event has happened and a man says this is bad now this is passing of a judgment you say this is bad the philosopher will say but what is the criterion of it being bad what is a bad what in what consists the badness of the thing then you have to analyze as to oh because you are personally interested or personally involved you thought that to you the reaction is bad or to you it appears to you it is not fundamentally bad you would say such knowledge is relative this is not correct knowledge yes yes you see if you take for instance a and take a big incident like a french revolution a historical event 
Now to the people who must have lived in the French Revolution, it must have appeared a very horrible time. Very horrible. You see, some of the writers you can read even now and you can see how contrary were the ideas held about French Revolution, even in the, even in the very the, the years in which it was passing, you see. And even subsequently within one generation, there were people who were for it and against it with vengeance, you see. Uh, vindication of France and uh, Burke's French Revolution and uh, then uh, Tom Paine's Rights of Man and so on. If you read, you'll be surprised to know how divided were the intelligent people, the best brains of the times. Remember, not ordinary third class people, no. People who could think and see events. And they were divided into two camps. Now, anybody who lived in the time of the French Revolution in Paris would have thought this is a very bad time. We had never seen a worse time. Daily, not less than four to five hundred people were guillotined. You see, a shooting is a process which is comparatively more, you know, I mean, more kind. Guillotining is a process very near the, the butcher's task. You see, it is a cutting of the man's head by putting a knife right down. Four to five hundred people every day. If one party came to power, it went on for some days. If the opposition came to power, the same thing. So that, uh, you know, one time 500 of this group were killed, while another time 500 of this group were killed, and, and killed in a, in a guillotine way. You see, it was a very primitive fashion in which they disposed of the human opposition. <laughs> well, now, if you take the, the judgment of the man, it is a very bad event. Wicked, horrible, miserable. You know, worst of times. So Dickens wrote like that in his tale of two cities, one novel which is based on the French Revolution and the humor of the revolution, also its serious consequences. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. You see, <laughs> yeah, that is to say, some of the people thought it was the best of times, some of thought it was the worst of times. Now, if there, this reaction that this is bad or good is only limited, you go back 100 years forward, and then you look at the French Revolution, you say, after all, it wasn't so bad. On the whole, it was not the best of times, but it gave something to mankind. You say, yes, the rights of man, democracy, individual judgment, freedom, equality, fraternity. Uh, well, quite right, something done for mankind. The whole of Europe would not have got the democratic constitution, but for the French Revolution. Democracy, equality, and fraternity. That was the slogan. And I think that uh, we can say that the constitution of Europe, political constitution of European countries, underwent a radical change only after the French Revolution. Definite. There's no question about it. It wouldn't have come about but for the pressure of French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars. Well, now, there you find that the knowledge or the judgment passed by contemporary mind, even the best of them, is not reliable. What I was wanting to say is that uh, knowledge cannot be said to be only opinion. Or contemporary knowledge is not the test of the knowledge of the thing. Knowledge, if you probe deeper and deeper, you will find that knowledge ultimately, when you say, I want I want the objective world and the subjective world, inner world and outer world, you begin to acquire the knowledge of the outer world. In that, you have to every time make the instrument more and more subtle if you want to succeed in acquiring knowledge. Because knowledge means awareness. Knowledge is not information, awareness. So that now I am aware of the sky and the earth meeting there, then, when I prepare an instrument or a telescope, say, no, it is not meeting there, it is far further off. I am now aware of the same phenomenon on a, on a, differently, because I use a more subtle method, so that the instrument should become more subtle and more penetrative, so to have a more capable of giving a wider range to our knowledge, and the consciousness must become, well, wider in its awareness. The awareness must increase. And this awareness, scientists would say, must be confined to objective world. Why do you want to be aware of any other world? Scientists claim stands that I give you a knowledge which is general to all mankind. Show me another knowledge which can be so general to all mankind. Only answer can be given by the spiritualist, by the man who believes in the spirit. He says, yes, just as your knowledge is 
capable of being experienced by all, so is the spirit capable of being experienced by all. As you have your processes, so has the man who wants to reach the experience or awareness of the spirit. If you say uh, fundamentally matter and its ultimate constitution, all these multiple elements that you see in material world are reducible to one common substratum of either an energy content or matter content, you know, electrical uh, content of matter ultimately energy. Well, the same is true of spirit. It is reducible to one substratum, one spirit pervading all. So that uh, uh, this, this is as much general knowledge for available to mankind as is knowledge of science. How can the scientist claim that uh, his knowledge is more valid? If he says that I have brought about a change in human life by application of scientific invention, electricity or steam or radar or radioactivity and so on, well, uh, man can say what uh, Jesus Christ or Gautam Buddha have brought about a change by an inner change in their selves, isn't it? And those changes are not in, in the subtle world, they are brought changes in the material world of human life on earth. There are changes that did not happen somewhere in the abstract mind. These changes happen in, in human life. Many people, you know, many, many buildings have arisen because of these people's work, you can say. Many songs have been uh, you know, written or music has been affected, poetry is affected, literature is affected, life is affected, emotions are affected. Well, whole life has been moulded. So you cannot say that, therefore, it is less effective knowledge. You see, the, the, the scientists claim that the natural phenomena, that is the content. And you, you reduce yourself, therefore, to almost a receiving apparatus. If the scientist were asked fully to, to, to state himself, he would have to say something like this. Reduce yourself to become receiving apparatus. Man should not react to the, to the things that come. Must go on receiving and say, yes, uh, I receive this impression or receive this sensation. That's all. Now, this is impossible for human being constituted as he is because he is an individual. He is an ego and an I. And he will react. He says, no, react scientifically only. A scientist would say, you go and look at sunrise. Then you say the sunrise means the earth has gone round 24 hours. Isn't it? 24 hours it just you know, rotated round its axis. Sun has been standing there. And the, the surface, same surface of the earth has been now again exposed to the light of the sun. It is the correct thing. So he says, when you see this phenomenon, well, see that the earth has again entered the orbit of the light of the sun, that's all. To say it, oh, so the sunlight is, sunrise is beautiful, this is redundant, extra, why? You see, the, the, the rise of the sun, <laughs> scientifically, is only the coming of the earth again into the, into, the, into the orbit of the light of the sun, that's all. Now, earth has entered again the orbit of the light. You say it is a, it's magnificent, beautiful, or you go to a great mountain and say sublime. Well, you say these are, you may have for your pleasure, it is an indulgence which can be permitted, but it is not knowledge. Now, this way of putting it is, is not correct also, because there is no one way of knowledge. Knowledge does not consist only in an impersonal perception of sensations and perceptions. Knowledge also is a, a... There are many avenues of knowledge available to men. Men acquire, as I told you, knowledge means awareness. And this awareness can take place from body consciousness right up to the inner spirit consciousness. Awareness in man can uh, act. Now man is not aware of many functions of his body. If he develops body consciousness, he will become aware of them. There are cases in which a man is able to control the beating of his heart. They are tested by medical counsels. I am not talking of possibility only, but actuality. A man comes and says, Sir, examine my, my you know, well, heartbeat. Now I am going to stop it. He stops it for two, three, four minutes. Well, then he says, now I am starting it. He starts it. So this is increase in the awareness. 
the body is aware, but in the, in the case of animals, it is so far superior to man, the physical consciousness. Tremendous. You, you can't. Because we have now been, for hundreds of years, thousands of years, so much accustomed to use of our mind and, uh, you know, overcome the sensational apparatus that our sense apparatus has become comparatively less aware in its capacity to, to act and react and to grasp. You see, if you take a cow, you can touch any part of her body and immediately the skin will react. You will see that she is able to shake her skin on any part of the body. Man has lost that capacity. He might have once upon a time. It is gone because man has accustomed himself to uh, so many you know, other reactions that those in the lower kingdom, in the insect, the vegetable, animal kingdom and birds, you find that knowledge is already acting in the sense of awareness. Only it acts instinctively, like an instinct. There you see some idea of content of knowledge conveyed to us by the lower kingdom. What is knowledge? Awareness. That is knowledge. An ant, you know, puts her house, so to say, her ant hill, at a place where water would not easily accumulate. This is a scientific observation. That in a, in a ground, the ants will go on, you know, building their house only at a higher level where water easily does not accumulate. This is, this is very well known. A, an animal in the, in the jungle where there is no water knows where water is. A cat always finds her, her you know, her, her road to the house from which you, you put a, we put a cat once 10 miles off, she came back. Within 12 hours, she was back. Within 12 hours, she was back in the house. A bird knows, migratory bird knows the, the, the way, so to say, it is as if they were going on a chart. Like the, like the aeroplane, you know, the pilot who, who goes, they, they go, they know the, where to go. Winter migrations and so on. A cow that is entering your field to graze illegally, I mean, they, they know that to get into some field in which a good crop is standing, they will enter. And if the proprietor enters and notices the cow, the cow notices the proprietor before he is able to act. I have seen hundreds of cases, hundreds of cases myself, that uh, the man comes and says, oh, there is a cow, I must go. By that time, cow has already come to run away from the field. She has known it. Well, this instinct is really the awareness. This awareness is the content of knowledge. And the scientists claim that you must be aware only of the sense reactions and perception only on the level of sense is to ask too much because man has a, com a complex apparatus of knowledge available to him, given to him. Why should he be confined and made to confine himself to the evidence only of his sense and sensation? That is what I told you the other day, that if a rainbow takes place in the sky, the scientists would say that you must only perceive the difference in the wavelength of light. It is only green, yellow, blue, and you know, violet and so on. A patch of light which means difference in the wavelength of light. White light of sun is analyzed into the rainbow. Really speaking, if the seven colors are moved vigorously, you will only see white color. So white color is the is the synthesis of the seven colors into which the anal analysis takes place. That is what you must perceive when you see the rainbow. Oh, what is the meaning of the words worth jumping out and saying, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky? Now this is also is another reaction possible to, to human consciousness. This is another level of awareness. Why do you say that he must be aware only of the difference in the wavelength of light and not aware of his heart jumping up at looking at the rainbow. The, the same thing happens to ripples in the water, in a river or in a lake. When the ripple takes place, the scientist would give you an equation of uh, hydrostatics. You see, he would say it is due to the force of surface tension in water and the pressure of the wind that is moving. Mm, that creates the, the ripples in the water, you see. There is a force of surface tension and there is action of the, of the breeze upon it and the, the ripples are produced. 
Why do you say that ripples have got a, you know, a design about it which attracts you as a very beautiful a set of designs or pattern? Well, this argument was taken up by, I think, Sir Arthur Eddington in his uh, Gifford Lectures in 1934 or 5. Mm, and uh, in that, uh, Nature of the Physical World, that's the name of the book. And he very beautifully put one argument there, which I give you now. So the limit of this uh, claim of science to be the only valid process of acquiring knowledge. He says that uh, human body is only nothing else but, uh, you know, molecules or atoms or electrons moving at great speed of light. Is it not? Human body, physical body of man is made up of electrons. Now, if a scientist is given a proposition that uh, what is his wife? Then he says, well, she is a collection of multi-million electrons moving at the speed of light. And uh, yes, it is. Scientifically speaking, his wife is only a collection of multi-million electronic elements moving at the speed of light, and uh, that is what she is made up of. But that will not explain his relation to her. So he says that, therefore, to say that knowledge or the content of knowledge, this is valid and the other is invalid, he says is not tenable. Yes, you, you, you have, for instance, a man is confronted with the sense of right and wrong, not always intellectually, true and false, proper and improper, good and bad. Now, this is an instinctive reaction from what is intellect, not perception from anything outside. This is not scientific at all. It's a conscience, a, a spontaneous, instantaneous movement of decision from conscience, and which, which intervenes with an imperative, you know, movement, which almost seems as if a spontaneous knowledge, knowledge was at, at work. You, the man is faced with a, with a choice of, between two. And immediately this is right, without thinking about anything, without any logic, without any argument. How does he arrive at it? How to say that this is not a valid content of knowledge? A decision that springs from the conscience, an instantaneous movement of choice or rejection that comes to the surface of man's consciousness when he is presented with the choice between a duality in his life, is as claimant to the validity of not being called knowledge as any scientific fact or phenomenon. You cannot refuse to say that, no, this is, well, how does a man decide? He decides not always by logic, not always by referring to sensation and, and what his senses tell him and what he perceives. He perceives by an inner, inner movement of conscience where something like a you know, magnetic needle is at work. A magnetic needle which simply goes and points to the North Pole. Finished. Now, why does the magnetic needle point to the North Pole? That's another question. But it does point, isn't it? If you have a magnetic needle, it always points to the North. When in the heart or conscience of man, there is a magnetic needle which suddenly says, this is right. And he, he takes the reading, that's all. This is right and that direction. And if he's sincere, he, he finds that he's right. His choice is not false. I mean, choice is justified by... By what happens ultimately. So, knowledge derived by act of conscience in the decision, a choice between good and bad, right and wrong, true and false, is not invalid knowledge, is equally capable of being accepted as valid content of knowledge. You take aesthetics or sense of beauty. Knowledge of uh, you know, that comes to man as a perception of beauty is not always scientific. It has nothing to do with perception. It is another sense altogether. A sense of this is a sense of, you know, well, uh, perfection of form. And that, per that sense of perfection of form is, is, is also knowledge. Because awareness, you see, it is increasing the awareness, development of awareness, widening. In fact, if you observe the human life, 
the field of collective life is provided to man and if you look only from outside it looks as if it is to keep law and order collective life is there to to make society go on not only that it is there to give man a field for widening his self awareness collective life gives one an occasion to widen his consciousness widen his awareness he is made he is made wider than him his body wider than himself wider than his ego he is compelled almost you see apart from the gains of collective life which are preservation of society preservation of standards of life culture social fabric political structure economic you uh, know uh, stability and so on these are the gains of collective life but more important and added to it is the 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 increase in the awareness of the individual with the social field the family life the collective life the the, the national life efforts to man a greater awareness a awareness the the uh, man is said to be developed when his awareness becomes well capable of a wider application content of his awareness becomes more and more then he has got knowledge that is the con- uh, idea of knowledge knowledge is when it it touches the same object on on many points and differently if you are only a gardener who is interested in selling flowers your awareness of the rose will be one you have a god and every time you see how to produce more and how to sell at the highest price it has nothing perhaps to do with the beauty of the rose the beauty of the rose goes on another level same object giving you multiple points of being aware about it and to say that no no we must confine your view only well it is to limit our bitterly the field of man's growth in fact field of knowledge to say that this is knowledge and the other is not is not correct you must allow the individual to become you know to increase his awareness and aesthetic awareness artistic sense artistic awareness is also a content of knowledge knowledge therefore uh, when we say consists in growth of awareness and this awareness moves in man on many planes of consciousness it moves on his physical consciousness on the body consciousness one can increase the awareness on nervous plane he can increase his awareness on vital plane he can increase his awareness and yoga is this unlimited increase of awareness because the scientist by experimentation have come and revealed that the basis of all material manifestation is one there is one thing at the bottom of all matter well the man who goes on increasing his awareness ultimately comes to the conclusion that all is ultimately one and this awareness of oneness it is that gives him the highest content of knowledge in fact all true knowledge in life is always by identity and not by mere perception even perception is an effort at identity when you perceive a thing you know, the sense goes out to become one with it only because it is limited it cannot become completely identified and therefore it takes a limited view and gives limited knowledge it is effective within limits but true knowledge is always by identity by oneness even in mental knowledge even in life knowledge even in knowledge of the of the, of the behavior of life or conduct if an essay is written on on sugar and it's a sweetness you can read four pages and you will know medically how the the, the you know the the nerves in the in the constitution of man i mean his tactual sense in his tongue well uses certain enzymes when sugar comes in contact with his tongue yes there will be a very long equation to give you first the constitution of sugar you know fructose and dextrose and uh, there are four or five sugars 
and each one has a different constitution chemically. Then the uh, coming in contact with the tongue of the man, well, the, the enzyme with the tongue oozes is, is also a particular kind. And then you read all the medical and the chemical report of what happens when a human being tastes sugar. Well, it's all right. It has not conveyed to you what is the taste of sugar. Do you know mentally what, what it means? Medically and chemically, you have known the, the, the whole process of taste of sugar. When you have actually tasted, then you have known it by identity. And you exactly know what it means. All that chemical equation, medical report is completely known as soon as you have tasted sugar. Anger. You can write an essay on anger. And uh, mentally perhaps you have a mental picture and idea, a structure of ideas about what is anger. But you get angry for one minute and get back to a normality. You know, that is anger. And that is a much more intimate and correct knowledge than uh, any amount of intellectual construction or representation of it given in the human mind. All true knowledge is generally by identity, even in ordinary life. One does not acquire the, the most effective knowledge by intellection, as they call it, you know, by ratiocination. It is acquired by identity, by oneness. And this effort at oneness is the basis of yogic effort. That if you can become one with the object that you want to know, well, then all worth knowing is known. The highest activity of human consciousness, the cultural heights which man has attained, are by this process of identity. You will watch keenly, carefully, and you will see if you become a keen observer. Take poem. How is a poem created? It is not created by knowledge of uh, science. A poem is created from within, from inside. The consciousness of the creator or the poet is objectivized, so to say, isn't it? He projects it in the form of his creation. What is a poem? The poet himself thrown out in the form of rhythm from harmony or an inspiration or an inspired utterance. It looks as if it is outside, but it's not. there is nothing. It's an inner self projected outside. He can, when it is projected, look at his as if it was somebody else's. Yes, he can make it an objective thing. A poem or a creator, an artist, from where does he bring the creation? Yes, from a deeper content of consciousness. It is from the deeper awareness. That awareness is not confined to senses, not confined to to the limit of human reasoning only, not confined only to his conscience, which is capable of being infinitely expanded. This is what the philosophers and the yogis mean when they say that you must not arbitrarily limit the scope of experience, scope of awareness. You must allow it infinite scope and say, there are inner worlds also, just as you can go into outer space beyond the earth, you can go into inner space within the heart or within the mind. In fact, Upanishad actually speaks of it. Antar radai akashe, they will say, in the inner sky of being, in the infinite sky of inner being or mind. Well, you enter into it, then you enter into an infinity where you can be aware of many things of which the outer mind is not aware. It's quite tenable proposition after all, experiment for experimentation, there is no reason to limit man to say this experiment you should make. You can allow him to make an experiment and find out whether the awareness can be deepened into inner being, become more profound or heightened into a higher being and rise almost to infinity. Then from that infinite status of awareness, things become different. Not materially, the same but then quite different afterwards. See, you take a child. It's playing doll's house. Now, this is objectively true. And doll's house has some truth behind it. When it grows, it knows what is a doll's house. What it means, what it signifies, isn't it? Now, afterwards also it looks at the doll's house. 
when one has grown into maturity, one can look at the doll's house. And when one has looked at the doll's house, it is not the same doll's house that he saw when he was a child. Isn't it? Because to him now the content of what the doll's house symbolically represents has become clear by experience. He has known it. The old self doesn't change, it's not broken up. But you have risen to another plane of consciousness, isn't it? From that consciousness of the child. And now the doll house remains as it was, and yet it is not now the same. The world is the same. When you have risen to that consciousness and awareness and widening of it, it will remain the same. All Things that are there will be known as they are, and something will be added which will so radically change that you can say, now it is not the same world. It is not the same world. This, this is a very tangible experience in the case of artists, for instance, you see. You go to a fine landscape. And um, there where the landscape is most beautiful, you find people who are living in there, isn't it? Kashmir or a place in Nilgiris or somewhere here in the, the, in the places where there is a sublime natural landscape. There are people who stay there. To them, most probably, it is an everyday professional affair to take people round and, you know, uh, to, to <laughs> it, is, it is worth so much. I mean, the process is there, it's worth so much. To the artist, it is, it is simply another world, altogether different. The mountain is not merely a conglomeration of stone. There is, there is a living uh, entity or presence which he feels, or a, or a harm in your self-existent peace, or some other thing absolutely unrelated to the normal man's operations, so that objects are not the same. And I pointed out to you, I think, when I spoke to you about Tagore's interpretation of the rose. I don't know whether it was to you or to some other place that I spoke about it. Tagore in one of his books says that the perception of world as beauty takes a man on a different plane of consciousness than the plane of utility on which normally acts. Normal man acts on the plane of utility, what is useful to life, what he will do with certain things, how he will utilize certain things, that's how. Plane of beauty frees him from this pressure of necessity and utility. What I will do with rose is not important. How the rose will serve me and in what way I will utilize is not the point of view at all. It is, it is a, making the world independent of the pressure of possessive tendency, need, necessity, dictate of utility. Man is dictated by utility in his you know, normal actions. Beauty, a sense of beauty, immediately frees one from, look at it from, quite independent. You have nothing to do with you. You are not going to use it. But even as it is, then you perceive the thing as it is. And when you perceive the thing as it is, then you perceive the beauty of it. And so the, the, he gave the instance of the rose, that if you take the rose flower, if you look at it biologically, it means as a student of you know, science of plants, then you will see that it's a laborer. It's a plant is a laborer in nature, in the workshop of nature. Every plant is a laborer, including rose. And it has to live. It must absorb elements, it must eat, it must thrive, it must grow, it must have support, it must have water, it must have temperature, it must have, you know, <coughs> nourishment given to it. You know, you, farmers give, what is it called? You know, it is, uh, let's say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes, it is the, the, the area, I forget this, just the word is there and it's not coming. <laughs> it is just like, eh? yes, yes, fertilizers. Well, it adds uh, something which will help its growth, sunlight, water, air, rain, Climate, temperature, pressure, salts, white potassium nitrate or hydrochloride or whatever is necessary must be there and must be taken at a certain time in definite proportion if the plant wants to live. 
So it's like a laborer working. If it commits a mistake, it is condemned to die. This is the outer appearance of the rose. He said, but when man looks at it subjectively, then it comes as if rose is symbol of leisure, as if it has nothing to do. It is a dandy that is there and showing all its, uh, uh, you know, showing itself off, so to say, and saying how beautiful I am. And uh, that perception, he says, how uh, that is the correct perception. There's another level where it is moving. And then when you perceive that aspect of it, you are in communication with something uh, which is very great because it is at the very basis of this creation. When you perceive the beauty of the rose and feel the mystery of it, the, the infinity of it, so to the profundity of it, that this earth which we normally in, in our unconsciousness or less awareness speak of it as if it was unconscious or inert, has within it the capacity to develop the rose and allow the rose all the elements from within itself and give rise to a pattern of beauty and form and perfume which you say is, is really unearthly. Something that is, that is so beautiful that you say, oh, this could not belong to the earth. So that that gives you another dimension of perception. Knowledge is not confined to sense dimension. There are dimensionality of knowledge. Knowledge comes to man on various dimensions. And the yogi's jikar is, is, is pleading is that you should not confine man to one dimension and say this dimension of perception gives him valid knowledge. The other dimensions of perception doesn't. It is not direct. Consciousness is multidimensional in man and on every dimension he has the capacity and potentiality of an infinite awareness. And on every level he must be allowed to in infinite awareness of growth of his consciousness till he rises to a plane of consciousness where all knowledge gets unified the world that he has perceived gets unified and something is added which he cannot find anywhere in the normal movement of his efforts at knowledge. Knowledge is awareness, self-awareness. Even when we are becoming aware of the universe, we are really trying to identify it itself with ourselves. It is our self-awareness that is at work in the cosmos. It is oneself that is, when you say, I want to know, it's an effort that I am outside and I want to know myself. You cannot know somebody else. Two disparate things cannot come in contact with each other. Two things which are so dissimilar to each other that there is no relation between them, there will be no communication between them. The fact that our mind or our heart or our consciousness can contact the universe is a proof that there is a common medium connecting ourselves and the universe. You cannot acquire the knowledge of something with which you are not connected. Something which is so disparate to ourselves that we can say, oh, this and myself have no relation. Then you can't know it also. You will not even negatively perceive it. The fact of an object being presented to the knowledge is almost an axiomatic movement of effort at identity. You want to say, I am outside. What is this universe? which seems to be myself projected outside. I want to know it. And it is that which really goads the man to, to seek outside. One self that is all, that has become all, that has become everything. Well, it is when one has risen to that one wide self-awareness, which is infinite, supreme and one, then in it all knowledge gets integrated. All the dimensions of human consciousness on which acquires knowledge, aesthetic, idealistic, emotional, you know, ethical, religious, scientific, all knowledge gets integrated into the widest knowledge of that self because all that to it is his own self-expression, its own self-expression. It does not reject matter or material science because the scientist says this is only valid knowledge. It knows the utility of scientific knowledge also in the growth of human consciousness. Knowledge is identity with the object of knowledge. And the object of knowledge is only one. An infinity of 
you can say universal energy that is manifesting itself, a dynamic movement of a consciousness which is at work in the cosmos and identity with it is a sign of knowledge. So it's not a static identity, identification. <coughs> when you say awareness, by awareness you do not mean necessarily a movement only or a want of movement. If you stand on a mountain and see, you passively perceive, but the whole awareness of the place is within you. The landscape has gone inside <coughs> somewhere. You are aware of it. That is a con it, landscape is there, but it is also there within you. And you are ho uh, holding it. Anytime you can awaken it in your memory. You can project it in a work of art. It is indirectly perhaps influence your your you know your way of thinking, way of looking, way of expression. What it has done, if you become aware, you will know how it is, what it is doing. Because unless you allow an infinite possibility to human growth of awareness, you will be arbitrarily living, putting a limit to man's capacity for growth. And scientifically even, it is not rational to put a limit to the possibility of experiments in the growth of awareness. Knowledge consists in allowing an infinite scope for growth of awareness. Yoga promises the highest in the sense that it takes the objective world and the growth of awareness of the objective world and adds to it the growth, infinite growth of inner awareness. And this inner awareness can make the human being capable of knowing his multidimensional you know, content of knowledge and ascend or make him ascend to a level from where all that gets integrated even the outer knowledge as well as the inner knowledge. Knowledge acquired by the whole of humanity, knowledge acquired by the individual in his own self. And the whole knowledge being integrated is able to utilize it for the highest fulfillment of man. We are trying to acquire a knowledge which will make man feel that he can have his full fulfillment on earth as an individual and as a collective being. Well, that, unless you allow it, a full growth of awareness is not possible if you limit it only to his capacity to be aware of scientific knowledge because that gives him knowledge only of one corner of himself and not of the whole full scale or full hierarchy of his multidimensionality. The full hierarchy must be allowed to be fully developed in its awareness. Then science will find its proper place, art will find its proper place. The, all the growth of man's consciousness through the centuries will be integrated. And individual himself also will become rich, rich, not materially, but rich in his inner capacity. Or his greed or his you know, ambition or his ego or selfishness. No, he will be able to perceive the same object from so many angles that almost he will be capable of identifying it, himself with it. And when he has known it by identity, well, there is nothing more to be known. When a thing is known by identity, it is the highest and most effective knowledge that one can get. And every situation in life, when guided by that awareness of identity, well, makes life a life of knowledge, a life in which well, there is no possibility of what people call error. Error is the failure of this awareness. Limitation of awareness leads to error. When there is a full integrated awareness and an ascent to the highest one level of knowledge, the identity itself acts in such a way as to lead to what we call perfect action in the sense of action motivated by perfect knowledge. And that is why we want to acquire in the yogic development that awareness which will make us conscious of the will that is at work in us and conscious also of the way to fulfill that will. It is for that that we want to increase this capacity for knowledge. And in that growth, we don't want to confine ourselves to the so-called outer aspect of man's knowledge because that is a limited field of man's awareness which arbitrarily limits the possibility of his full development. I think that conveys to the house some idea of what we mean by knowledge. Uh,
in the yogic sense where all knowledge that is acquired is included and something is added which is lacking in the present scheme of man's knowledge. I think